Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity to come speak here. Uh, today, I'm going to be speaking with you about uh, my book, Privacy's Blueprints, The Battle to Control the Design of New Technologies. And uh, I really want to uh, start off with a series of stories to tell you a little bit about what the book is about. Um, so many of you, if not most of you, are familiar with the Cambridge Analytica Facebook um, dust up, as it were, uh, and there's a, there was a lot going on there where lots of information that was taken from Facebook uh, that eventually made its way towards Cambridge Analytica and then outward and it caused a huge um, public discussion about privacy and platforms. And there was a lot going on built in with that, but one of the most interesting things was uh, the fact that there was a big debate about whether this was originally what they referred to as a breach or something else, right? And one of the things that sort of came up uh, and one of the things that, it, that indeed uh, the platform actually said is that, that permission was actually granted um, uh, through the privacy settings to have this sort of information uh, given to third-party apps. And in fact, it wasn't just um, the one app that was collecting lots of information. This was actually a relatively common practice that people were agreeing to. But if you actually start to dig in and think about, well, well, what was actually agreed to and what did it look like, you realized it was sort of one small little option nested within lots of other small little options that existed. And while you may technically have agreed to it, um, it's, it was sort of binary and, and relatively hidden. Um, and so it, it resulted in a, a lot of confusion because the people that seemed to be angry about it said, well, wait a second, I didn't agree to that. And then, of course, they were shown exactly where they did, and they said, okay, well, maybe that wasn't the best thing. The second story I want to talk about, this is a still taken from an internet-connected um, baby monitor. And the most disturbing thing about this, and this was disturbing in and of itself, isn't that, that there was this one still, but rather there's an entire search engine dedicated to finding these sorts of stills because these sorts of devices are so routinely compromised um, and, and so easy to, to sort of take control of that there's actually an entire collection of them online, um, which I thought was also relatively disturbing. And then the third story that I wanted to talk about was what many of you may have been familiar with, which is the dispute between the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Apple over whether to build in some sort of bypass to its encryption scheme and, and an authentication protocol to allow it to access the phone um, of the San Bernardino shooter. Now, what do these three things have in common? They all are stories about the design of information technologies. And in the book, I focus on how things are built and the way in which they affect our privacy. And I want to make three points today, and I make, try to make three larger points in the book. One, design matters for privacy. And more than that, which may seem relatively evident, we need to have a better conversation to explore why design matters and how design matters for our privacy, because I think it matters more than what most people regularly consider. Two, and this is the main thesis of the book, which is why it's in bold, which is that privacy laws should take design more seriously. And not just the law, but also uh, industry policy, industry standards, industry norms. We focus a lot on personal data. Which data, what data is being collected, how is it being used, who is it being share, shared with. We focus a lot about transparency, but I argue that there's actually, there's a, there's a gap. There's, a, there's a, a huge area within which design affects a lot of what people to be considered their personal privacy interests that we don't regularly talk about in law and in industry policy. And three, and this is perhaps one of the more controversial aspects of the book, a design agenda for law and policy should have roots in consumer protection and surveillance law, not the standard data protection framework that is in becoming incredibly popular through frameworks like the GDPR, which everyone has probably at least mildly aware of given the thousands of emails that you received somewhere around late April that says, we've updated our terms. Um, 
And it's built around this model that tends to prioritize certain kinds of data collection and processing rules, I think at the expense of ignoring some nuances about the ways in which design actually controls our privacy. Okay, so let me expand upon these three points. One, design matters for privacy. What do I mean by that? I mean that design matters for privacy because it is everywhere, because it is power, and because it is political. First, design is everywhere. Many people might recognize what this is. Does anyone know what this is? Has anyone seen this before? It is a promo user interface, early user interface for the app Snapchat. Now, if you were to look at this knowing nothing, sometimes I give this talk and I, I speak with people that haven't used technology that much or are only sort of casual users of a lot of apps. And so I, they've never seen this at all. And so I like to sort of pause and, and I say, if you had never seen this before, what would you think this user interface is, a, is designed to accomplish? And some of the usual answers I get are, well, it's probably something that relates to taking and sending of a picture, right? We can tell that exists for, we saw the timer here. What does the timer probably do? If we had to guess. Yeah, it, it, it makes the, the picture disappear after maybe a certain amount of time. We see the scroll wheel that we can select, right? So we clearly have options, right? It's clearly meant not just for taking photos and storing them, but for sharing them. We can tell because we look at, we see a send button, right? It's got the little arrow. And then one of, one of my favorite things about this user interface, and one of the, one of the most um, demonstrative sort of signals that we see about the way in which this is supposed to be used, what do you think this particular app, just looking at this, what kinds of pictures do you think the app is inviting you to send? Naughty pictures, right? Originally, this is how Snapchat was sort of perceived publicly, right? Uh, and you can't blame them because look, we've got an incredibly carefully cropped little square here where we can't tell whether these young women are clothed or not, they're having fun. And the implicit message built in through every aspect of design of this user interface is that you can trust this app with things that you might not trust in more permanent sorts of social media, right? Because it goes away. It is safer than if you were to use, say, uh, some other service that, that where the pictures are stored forever. And all of this is conveyed with less than three words. It's all signals. It's all things that we intuitively seem to understand through the design of information technologies. And I started looking for examples for this book. And once you start to look for examples of the ways in which design affects your privacy, you see them all over the place. And, and not just in, in obvious ways, but in subtle ways. So I don't have to tell everybody here what this technology is. And there were some design decisions that, um, that went into Google Glass that I thought were incredibly interesting. The most obvious privacy relevant feature for Google Glass is what? The camera, the camera on the front, right? The one is it's literally staring straight at us. Um, but that's not the design feature. I mean, I guess you could have designed glass without the camera. That was a design decision that implicated um, people's privacy because it's able to be surveilled. But of course, the counter argument to that is this camera doesn't really do a lot that isn't already being done by another camera, right? The one that everyone has in their phones. And so the design decision that's relevant for Google Glass is not just that there's a camera but that the camera is always potentially visible, right? Now there's a small transaction cost, but it's significant at scale, which is in order to take a picture with our normal phones, we have to reach into our phone, pull it out, right? Open it up, we fiddle with it, we aim it, and then we take the photo. Now that doesn't seem like a lot on a per time basis, but that small transaction cost actually I think has a tendency to make people feel more comfortable with the fact that everyone is carrying around a sort of persi a persistent uh, uh, surveillance device in their, in their pockets all the time, whereas glass was met with a much more resistance, right? People tended to be um, 
more uncomfortable with it than they did with their phones. And I think the reason why is because the camera was always there, right? The transaction cost of having to dig into your pocket was suddenly gone. And all you had to do was utter a command or um, uh, sort of readily activate it. There was another design decision that I thought was really relevant to Google Glass that didn't get a lot of attention, but it's my understanding that Glass did not provide support for facial recognition technologies which was an interesting design decision um, and one that I think also had privacy implications, positive privacy implications. I don't have to tell anyone here what this symbol is as well, right? But for those um, that aren't familiar, this is the symbol of incognito mode. When you open up Google Chrome's browser and you go into incognito mode, you see, or at one point, I believe the, the icon has now changed, but at one point you saw this icon. And I always like to ask people, this is a, this is a design, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a signal to people. And if you were to just see this, what would you think the signal was? What is this meant to convey? I'm sorry? Concealment, right? Which, of course, is the purpose. I mean, it's called incognito mode. And we've got our, it seems like a sort of classic 1940s gumshoe, right? Someone that doesn't want to be seen, they put the, they can put their collar up, they've got a, a hat that they can pull down low, maybe glasses. Again, the, the implicit message just from looking at this is that you're safer if you want to hide. Now, of course, that's not exactly how incognito mode works, right? And, and indeed, when you open up incognito mode, um, you've got a list of things that say, by the way, here are all the people that can still see you when using incognito mode, which is a very important disclosure. But absent that, you might think, oh, well, I'm using the safe browser, right? The browser that doesn't record any history of me at all, right? It's completely incognito. And so without that, I think, important disclosure, this design would tend to shape people's expectations. And so when you look around, you tend to see these sort of design decisions everywhere that tend to be relevant for people's decisions about what to disclose, how much to disclose, and how safe they are in disclosing. Now, the second point that I want to make about design is that design is power. One of my favorite experiments that I talk a little bit about in the book was done by Leslie John, um, Alessandro Acquisi, and George Lowenstein at Carnegie Mellon University. And they got several people in to uh, answer this series of questions in a survey and a, on a screen. And they sat down and they were presented with a screen like this. And they asked them a number of different questions. And this is just a snapshot. And the questions ranged from sort of banal to relatively intimate to incredibly intimate. And this is just a short little snapshot here. They said, have you ever smoked marijuana? Have you ever cheated while in a relationship? Have you ever driven when you were pretty sure you were over the legal blood alcohol level, asking you to admit to committing a crime? Now, what's the first thing that you notice when I put this screen up? How bad are you, right? And so there were a series of design decisions that I think were particularly relevant here. One is the fact that bad is sort of capitalized, right? And then they use the sort of cutesy you sort of text speak, right? How bad are you? Multiple question marks, which is indicative of what? Youth, right? Exuberance. What else do we have relevant to design here? The logo, the logo right? It's a, it's a devil. But it's not a bad devil. It's like an emoji devil, like a cute devil, right? There's one other design decision that I thought was really interesting, the font. It is written in Comic Sans, and no one in the history of the world has taken anything seriously written in Comic Sans font, right? And the overall implication, of course, of all of these design decisions, despite asking incredibly intimate questions, you know, questions that can implicate you in a crime, is that you're, how bad are you? You're bad. You know you're bad. Everyone's just a little bit bad, right? That's sort of the implication of every single design feature built into this. And then, of course, the control group they had looked like this. Gone is the sans serif, is, is, is the Comic Sans font replaced with this, you know, very formal sans serif, you know, font. Gone is our cute little question about how bad are you, and now it's just replaced with the imprimatur of Carnegie Mellon University, a very prestigious university, right? 
But the questions remained exactly the same, right? And, and, and I want to read directly because I don't want to misquote the results of their study. Um, but they, they call this the, the frivolous looking interface um, and this the non-frivolous uh, looking interface. And uh, the, they found that relative to the non-frivolous interface, participants in the frivolous looking survey that asked identical questions were on average 1.7 times more likely to admit having engaged in risky behaviors. For example, a participant in the frivolous looking survey was on average 2.03 times more likely to admit having ever taken nude pictures of himself or a partner. And the authors conclude, people it seems feel more comfortable providing personal information on unprofessional sites that are arguably partic uh, particularly likely to misuse it. Design is power. Design uh, doesn't necessarily dictate behavior, but it channels it. Every single design decision makes a certain reality more or less likely, right? And so it, it provides an incredible amount of power. And that leads me to my third point, which is that design is political. Design is always political. And when I say political, I don't mean political in terms of Capitol Hill. I mean political in terms of the distribution of power. So I give this talk uh, a, a little, and sometimes in response, people will come up afterwards and they'll say, why are you targeting design as something that we should be focused about in law, right? Instead of targeting the tools that we use to create, to, to create problems, why don't we target the harmful problems themselves? One of the examples that's been put forth recently is a knife can be used for good or bad, but we don't ban knives. Right? Instead, we say you can't use a knife to stab someone, but you can use it to cut food. And so, um, and so it's always some sort of version of the argument that, that there are no bad technologies, only bad uses of those technologies. And that should be the focus of our policy and, and law efforts. But I think that that actually um, tends to uh, cut against the fact that I don't think that there's such a thing as a, a neutral technology given the fact that every single design decision is meant to affect the world, right? That's what design is. It's a series of decisions that re get reflected in some sort of substance that affects the world in, in some particular way. Then there's no such thing as neutral technologies. Even ignoring certain realities is an acceptance of those realities in a certain sense. Um, and so we cannot ignore technology and the role of design in law and policy. We have to confront it head on. Um, and there, there may be reasons why we explicitly decide not to have rules against legislating technology. We don't want regulators, for example, dictating from top to bottom every single design decision in a ham-fisted way, right? Because, I mean, w you know, it's, it's difficult to think that they would know better how to build a lot of particulars of technologies than people that live it. Um, but that, too, has its own costs, right? And we need to be specific about which costs we want to embrace, right, and, and how to better balance them with a f the full range of concerns that we have. And the only way that we're going to do that is if we explicitly embrace the design of technology and how that is powerful in our laws and policies. So that leads me to my next point, which is that privacy law should take design more seriously, because right now it doesn't. It may seem like it relatively does. Um, there may be some uh, in this room or listening in online that have had experience dealing with regulators in the, with the uh, European Union and the general data protection regulation that deal with privacy by design and privacy by default. Um, but actually, I will argue that largely privacy law and privacy policy and the rules that we have even internally about privacy have a major design gap. Turns out, so I teach privacy law at Northeastern University, and it's a whole semester long course, but it turns out there are basically only three privacy rules that you have to follow. Um, and so I can save you all a lot of money if you're interested in taking a privacy law course. I'm just going to summarize it now. One of the rules is follow the fair information practices. This is the underlying ethos of the entire general data protection regulation. It's the, it's the idea behind 
uh, statutes that you are probably very familiar with, like the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, or even HIPAA has a, a, a sense of uh, follow the fair information practices. And the fair information practices are things that are so fundamental to our understanding of fairness with data processing that you probably have already internalized them without thinking about them. For example, people should have control over their information. They should, uh, databases should be transparent about what they're collecting. They should give people notice about what they're collecting and the ability to delete information or correct information. That you should only collect what you need and that you should delete it when you're done with it, right? The data minimization principle. There's the principle of accountability, that we should be accountable for these rules. There's the principle um, that uh, people should have also certain sort of access rights or portability rights to their data. These are all things that we've been talking about for a long time, and they all started with the fair information practices, which were actually originated in the mid and late 1970s and then made their way through, and now are as close as the world has come to a common language of privacy, which is pretty remarkable when you consider all the varying different cultural connotations that play into conceptions of privacy. The fact that we have a basic set of rules on how to fairly collect and process data is remarkable. And the FIPS are important. They're necessary. But here's the problem with the FIPS. They look like this, right? This is the way in which they get reflected. Because if you look at the FIPS, it almost always boils down to this idea of control. If you ask the CEOs of every major tech company in the United States and the world, how do you respect the privacy of your users? I bet money that they would almost all respond with some version of, we put people in control of their own information. This is one of the most dominant conceptualizations of privacy in the United States and around the world. The idea being that if we give users control of their information, then they get to decide for themselves what they want to do with their information and what they're okay with. They do a risk calculation, and if they are given that control, then if they exercise it, then presumably the giving of that control is enough to justify certain sorts of data practices because people approve it, right? They have control over it. Data subjects' autonomy, in theory, is respected. The, the uh, platform collecting information has done its moral duty under this conceptualization by offering the control, and we can all proceed together. And here's the problem with that. And here's the problem with control, think, of thinking privacy in terms of control generally, which is really popular, not just in industry. Governments conceptualize privacy as control. Advocates conceptualize privacy as control. It is by far probably the most popular way to define privacy. I teach privacy law, and on the first day, I ask my students to write out what privacy is. I say, what is privacy? And then we go around the room. I have 20 to 30 students, and I usually get around five to 10 different answers. But almost always, the most popular response is control over personal information. But again, the way that control is reflected in practice is through design. It is through buttons, right? Toggle switches, which in theory is still fine. Everyone knows what this is. Green means yes. Gray means no. Right? It's a toggle switch. Can Google Maps collect your geolocation information? Green means yes, gray means no. Yes, I have exercised control. I have made a decision. Privacy is respected. Onward we go. Except, of course, it doesn't always work out like that. Because it never looks just like that, does it? Right? We have a series of decisions to make. Because we don't want the decision to be just binary. If it's too binary, it's too abstracted, right? Privacy is complicated. There are nuances, right? Yes, no doesn't give enough choices. So we say, okay, I need lots of choices. I want nuance, right? This is, this is the inherent tension in defining privacy as control is give me nuance. So tech companies respond and they say, okay, we'll give you lots of different choices, right? Rather than just sort of one on off binary, we'll give you lots of choices, except, of course, that means that users are now responsible for analyzing those choices. And you say, okay, 
I've got, I've got the, the Find My iPad button and, and location-based alerts. I guess that's good, location-based iAds. I don't know what that means. Share my location, green, okay, I guess, I guess I'll try to figure that one out. Wi-Fi network, I don't know, I don't know what that button does, but I guess it's okay. Um, diagnostics and usage, pe popular near me, I guess that's good. And we have to make all of these sort of implicit risk calculations over and over again which is costly in terms of personal resources, right? Because people have limited amounts of time. And so we go through, but okay, so let's say we look at this, we make our design is set up in this way for us to, to, to effectuate the control that we're given. We do it and we say, whew, okay, I think I'm, I think I'm good. I think I've set my settings the way I want them. And then we, we take a deep breath and we back up and we say, oh dear, I've got lots of buttons to press over and over, right? And when the settings change, I've got to update them again. The problem with thinking about privacy in terms of control is that people are gifted with so much control that they choke on it. And it becomes, in practice, a way for risk of loss to be shifted onto users. Because if you fail to exercise that control, it's not the problem of the company that gave you the control, right? They're giving you the options. That's what you wanted. And so where it's, there's an inherent tension that almost is never going to be resolved, which is if you abstract it away and make control easy, if you provide one button for all of our, uh, our issues, then it becomes too generalized, right? There's too, too much stuff washed in, and so our ability to do a, a meaningful risk calculus is washed away. But if you provide every option under the sun, then it becomes overburdensome, right? It's a, it's a DDoS attack on our brain. And there's, there's no way that we can respond at scale. And so control, I think, is actually one of, uh, fundamentally one of the, the misguided, actually, ways to think about privacy in the modern data ecosystem, because it's never gonna work. It just doesn't scale, right? Unless we start having a conversation about prioritizing control, which gets really interesting, which we can talk about later. So there's this massive design gap in follow the FIPS, this ethic that we follow in all privacy law and in all industry sort of rules, which is you should give people control because design is leveraged to, instead of being autonomy enhancing, it actually is autonomy corrosive, right? Because we're given all these choices, we're sort of burdened in them or it's abstracted away to the point where it's meaningless. All right, that's rule one. Rule two is do not lie. Relatively simple rule, right? The Federal Trade Commission, which is the nation's top uh, regulator of privacy, has uh, authority to regulate unfair and deceptive trade practices. And as part of its regulation, it has one major rule, which is don't lie to people, right? That sounds relatively easy. The problem with the do not lie ethos, of course, is one of the similar problems to transparency and control generally, which is you can put technical truths in a place that nobody's gonna read them. Right? And we all know where you put the things where you want nobody to read it. Right? Where do we put it? If I want to be sure to put something in a place where I know no user is ever going to see it, where am I going to stick it? Privacy the privacy policy or the terms of use. Right? I do this for a living. I am a, a, a privacy law professor and I cannot scroll through the I, you know, terms of use quick enough to get to I agree. Right? Because, of course, there's no way that, it, that at scale anyone could collectively read them, right? It'd be, we, we'd have to take two days off of vacation a year just to read all the privacy policies we come into. And so do not lie can also get circumvented through design through putting it in a place where technical truth is, is ignored. And then there's the do not harm ethic. That's the last one. So the Federal Trade Commission also says don't, do, don't engage in unfair uh, trade practices that harm users in a way that's uh, not avoidable by the users themselves and in a way that's not outbalanced by countervailing benefits to the consumer. That's the sort of test they use. But of course the do not harm ethic is also uh, easily subverted through design because in the modern age the threshold for harm to rise to a legal violation is sort of high, right? Um, they, if, if you're going to, to, to bring a lawsuit against a company, then you don't want the harm to be, uh, this is creepy, right? Which is some of the things that happen, right? And creepy's not a, it's not a, a real word that has boundaries around it, right? Who, what, what is creepy? Lots of things could possibly creepy. Um, 
but that varies wildly according, you know, across the spectrum. And so the law, and, and in many ways rightly, actually says you've got to have a real tangible harm here. You've got to have some sort of financial harm, right? Someone stole your identity, someone stole your money, or you have to have some sort of clear emotional harm, right? And often it is your naked body was exposed publicly, right? Or something, something very visceral and something that, that has a clear boundary to it. But of course, many of the sorts of things that people quantify as privacy harms in the modern age is not actually those sorts of visceral harms, which can be relatively rare, but rather it's a little bit more of a death by a thousand cuts, right? We reveal a little bit of information here and we trickle a little bit of information there. None of it which rises to the level of what we would consider to be a privacy harm, but collectively we look up one day and we all become vulnerable, right? And we all see that, that we've gone down this road without actually having any one particular violation, yet here we are with lots of our information sort of exposed that, can, that could ultimately be leveraged against us. And so design also sort of does that through sort of the way in which we encourage short little amounts of information to be disclosed here and there. Oh, it's just a little information here. It's just a little information there. But collectively, it becomes a, a big issue. All right, so at this point, you may be saying, all right, smart guy, well, if this, we got the problems, what are we gonna do about it? And that actually is the next part of the book which is where I propose a theory of privacy law and design. And the theory is actually built around values, boundaries, and tools. And the values that I advocate for are actually not control, even though that's the dominant framework. I think there are better values that we can embrace, not only that will give um, U.S. industry and U.S. law a much clearer identity with respect to protecting personal information, but also one that doesn't sort of inherently have this tension where you have to choose between uh, meaningless abstraction or overwhelming nuance. Um, and that's trusted security and autonomy. In other words, I argue that our law and policy should encourage design that is trustworthy, that promotes or at least values obscurity and enhances autonomy. Now, what do I mean by that? Trust, I think, is one of the most important values uh, in the modern age with respect to the disclosure of personal information in platforms. Trust is key for commerce. Trust is key for personal relationships and intimacy. Trust is key for self-exploration. We tend not to disclose to other people in, a, in an attempt to sort of figure out who we are unless we trust those. If everything we say can be used against us, then we tend not to sort of engage in self-exploration. And so our design should reflect that. Our design should reflect uh, a sense of discretion, not necessarily confidentiality, but just discretion. We don't disclose everything all the time, right? This can be de-identification. This can be disclosure within a limited community. Um, it should encourage a sense of protection. Now, this is a little more obvious, right, which is, uh, don't store people's passwords in clear text and salt and hash and uh, let's encrypt traffic. We should protect the data. This is what we would refer to maybe as data security. A sense of honesty, and honesty is different from transparency. Transparency often gets touted as, look at, we, we've opened up the books to you, right? We, you can look inside and you can see whatever is available, but that's actually different than what I would consider to be acting honestly. Honestly is affirmatively disclosing the things that users want to know that maybe you would prefer not to tell them, but they should probably know, right? In other words, it's, it's a little bit more of affirmative obligation um, a, a, as a warning rather than full transparency. And then finally, and this is the, this is the hard one with respect to trust, um, design should be loyal to the user. And what I mean by that is it shouldn't elevate the interests of the platform unreasonably you know, or in unreasonable ways over the interest of the data subject. And we can talk about what I mean by that uh, in a minute. And that would be trustworthy design, design that is discreet, protective, honest, and loyal. Now another sort of uh, design choice which uh, doesn't, isn't quite as established in law and policy is the value of obscurity. Obscurity is the idea that when information is hard or unlikely to be found or understood, then it is to a relative degree safe. We rely upon zones of obscurity all the time in our everyday lives and we don't even realize it. How many people here have eaten out at a 
restaurant within the last two weeks? A number of people. Do any of you remember who was sitting two tables away from you? Probably not. You were in public, everyone could see you, but of course, we've de long since deleted that information. I flew here yesterday on an airplane, I don't remember what the person sitting next to me looked like, right? Even though it was in public. And we do this to help sort of ease, to, to prevent cognitive overburdening. And we rely upon this risk calculus all the time to make decisions. Um, when I'm walking out in, in public, um, you know, if, if, you know, you quickly want to sort of scratch in a, in a delicate place and you look around, no one's looking, right? You do it, right? Even though maybe if that were posted on, uh, you know, the, Wall, the, uh, the Times Square Jumbotron, then you would have second thoughts about it. But the odds of that are incredibly small. When you go shopping in a, a grocery store or a, a drug store, um, you're in public. You're picking out things that are delicate, but the odds that someone is standing right behind you writing down every single thing that you purchase is incredibly low, right? And the odds of that ever coming back to hurt you is also incredibly low. So we value obscurity, and, and the harm comes when uh, our obscurity is, is taken away from us in dramatic ways. In other words, there are lurches, obscurity lurches. Um, I've, been, I've written uh, very cl critically about facial recognition technologies, and one of the reasons why is I, I view it as an incredible obscurity lurch. Our faces, while public, um, basically allow us still to be relatively private as we walk in a crowd. But facial recognition technologies threaten that ability. Uh, it, it, it represents a dramatic obscurity lurch. And online, uh, some of my research is focused on there are things that can obscure you or make you more obvious, like search visibility, unprotected access, right? whether we protect something with a password, um, whether someone uses their real name or a pseudonym or no, no identifier at all, and, and whether things are clear, right? Sometimes things are obscure because people like the context to make sense of them. If I were to tell you all right now, um, hey, by the way, I just got the test results back, it's positive, you would have no idea what that meant, right? It's obscure to you, and it's safe to me because you have no idea what that means. Um, but if you had uh, the backstory, which is maybe that my wife and I were trying to conceive, then you would say, oh, I now understand, right? This is sort of hiding in plain sight with content. And so there are ways in which we can obscure information and, and preserve that obscurity. And then finally, the value that I advocate for is autonomy. Now, autonomy is different than control. Control can serve autonomy, right? The right to be free from external interference, the right to self-determination. but but if too much control actually threatens that autonomy. So I argue that a better value to embrace is autonomy rather than control. All right, and so that leads me to the final part of the book where I argue that a design agenda should have roots in consumer protection and surveillance law. Rather than saying, well, the fair information practices which everybody accepts uh, are uh, the thing that we should, we should adhere to, I, if you look, I say there are actually other areas of the law that have thought this out, that have taken design seriously. And I propose sorts of uh, boundaries uh, to avoid deceptive design, abusive design, and dangerous design. Deceptive design uh, is something that it, 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 we relatively uh, are doing a good job with both, I think, within industry and within policy in terms of not outright deceiving people. So, you know, if it says this is a, uh, the PATH complaint uh, filed by the Federal Trade Commission where Ad Friends actually didn't just allow you to Ad Friends, but it actually automatically sort of went in and scooped up the entire um, contact list. Uh, and then there's also the idea that maybe uh, it, we should avoid abusive design, which is the leveraging of people's own limitations against them. And this happens uh, sometimes in everyday life. We, we tend to sort of leverage people's own limitations against them. But it's another thing entirely to build an entire machine built to leverage people's own limitations against them. Um, this is an example of um, pricing, different differential pricing based on people's personal characteristics or the thing that made my uh, privacy law students really mad one year, which is uh, the fact that a certain travel uh, website could tell whether you're using a PC or a Mac and would show the, um, the cheaper um, uh, hotel rooms to the people using Windows PCs and the more expensive hotel rooms to the people using Macs based on the assumption that 
people that had Macintoshes were actually being more, uh, were, had, more had more money and were more affluent. Um, but there are tons of examples. So one of the examples um, that pops up uh, is, is when leveraging people's own limitations against them is our desire for conformity. Right? People have a strong desire sort of not to be, to be with the group or to do what everyone else does. And sometimes that can be worked against us. So uh, this shows up in the literature around dark patterns, which is a, a really interesting website. And this is one uh, where it says, get 10% off. And then at the bottom it says, no thanks. I'd rather pay full price for delicious tea, right? Which is sort of shaming people, right? Be like, oh, OK, well, I don't want to be the sucker here. And there are several other examples where you see because people's uh, pu voting records tend to be public in most states, um, some people have actually leveraged that. And they said, all your neighbors voted, and you didn't. Right? Here are the people that voted, and you didn't vote. Look, look how irresponsible you are, right? which is sort of a shaming. Um, or uh, uh, one here, which is um, <laughs> at the bottom, it says, no thanks. I'm fine with losing customers. I mean, who wants to click that? right? Now again, this is a very subtle sort of manipulative technique, but it's one that is at scale could tend to be uh, harmful in the right way. Another example of using people's own limitations against them is uh, the use of like double and triple negatives, right? So here it's decline, release of directory information. Note, most parents do not choose this option, right? So we've got lots of nots here. I do not want the release information. So when you start layering like double and triple negatives, then it's not, it's not lying. Right? It's, not, it's not deceitful, but it's, it's leveraging people's inability to sort of process the double and triple negative. I don't not never want this information released. Um, and then finally, there's dangerous design. Some designs are just inherently dangerous. This is a spy camera. It's designed for more or less one thing, right? which is to catch people in various states of undress. Right, because it's a clothes hanger. Right? It's meant to be put in rooms where people are taking clothes on and off. And I argue that that's dangerous design. As, as, as dangerous as surveillance that you know about is, I view surveillance that you don't know about to be even more potentially dangerous. And there are lots of potential responses to this, and I go into this in the second part of the book. Soft responses, moderate responses, and robust responses. So a soft response is we don't have to come in as regulators heavy-handed and say, we're regulating this to the hilt. Sometimes what privacy needs is some funding. It needs some uh, innovation. It needs some opportunity. It needs standardization. right? It needs educational opportunities. Um, and so I argue for a lot of different ways to improve people's privacies without passing some really heavy-handed regulations. Sometimes we need some moderate responses. Maybe judges just need to be a little more um, uh, sensitive to the role that design plays in people shaping people's expectations and their choices. And maybe regulators do too. This is an example of the padlock icon, which is ubiquitous online. We use it all the time. It's the, it, it is, it is the, the physical symbol of security. But we don't really question what it means to people as much, right? When people see the padlock icon, they usually think they're safe, right? Or secure. That, that, that's what a, a lock means. But what, is, what does it really mean on the practice? And maybe uh, there, there are ways in which these sort of padlock icons might act as, as sort of implicit promises. And then finally, there may be a need for heavy-handed regulations in certain instances. One of the things I've argued for um, uh, is in support of is the ban on spyware that we have right now, which is, I think, uh, relatively um, can be used in really malicious ways. And then another thing that's a little more controversial is I've argued in favor of moratoriums and bans on facial recognition technology, which I view as one of the most uh, uniquely dangerous technology, surveillance technologies um, ever invented. And then the final part of the book, I, I lay out what these, this blueprint of this design agenda might look in three different kinds of contexts, social media, hide and seek technologies, and the Internet of Things which is basically just um, a plea for me to stop, for, to tech companies to stop connecting people's underwear to the internet, which is one of the things. So, um, and with that, I would love to go ahead and, and go to the question and answer period. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. You've given some examples of bad designs. Uh, can you give an example of a good design, particularly in the area of providing user autonomy as you described? Oh, okay, um, that's, uh, uh, actually, there are several, I think, very good designs. Um, one might be there are areas in which, so after I, I sort of rail on control um, a lot, there are areas in which control might actually be really useful. 
I like the data subject right. I also sort of critique the GDPR, but now I'll backtrack on that a little too. Data subject rights that allow you to log in and review profiles. Um, uh, information that's kept about you, I think, are very useful because they can be done at the election of the user. Um, dashboards, for example, that allow you to review histories, locations, I think those are, those are very good. Um, and they, my general principle is that people should be protected regardless of what they choose, but if there are ways in which they can um, exercise autonomy on top of that baseline level of protection, then that, that should be encouraged. Um, there are also small little things that I like that, that a lot of people actually critique as not going far enough, but I like because they're obscurity protective. Um, for example, uh, YouTube released a tool that allowed you to blur people's faces, I believe. I love that tool. Um, and one of the reasons I love it is because it's obscurity protecting, right? It's one that if you happen to know the person that was in the video, then maybe you would recognize them. But to the world, that's actually a pretty good design, right? So in other words, people uh, are largely protected. We often don't want to be protected from everybody, just from certain sorts of risks, right? So um, uh, people, uh, I mean, the right to be forgotten is one of these things where people often want their name disassociated with being found for certain results, right? They don't need the information gone. They just don't want the HR person who is reviewing their application for a job they want to find it, right? And so there are certain sorts of things that can protect obscurity and design like that. And I think the YouTube uh, face blurring video is a great example of that. So how do you consider uh, metadata, like derived data for my data, right? How does that kind of play into this? And other, peop other people's data of me? So like there was the Facebook thing, I think, where other, where, right, other people had data on me and I won't be able to see their data of me, right? So for instance, if they had a phone number of me, but I never authorized Facebook to have my phone number, but they had it, Facebook now has my phone number, and I don't know that Facebook has my phone number. The question is sort of what is the role of metadata in all of this? And this is what I think really illustrates the limits of the control conception of privacy, because so much is actually out of our control. A really good example is genetic information. Right, so, so um, my sister uh, got one of the, the popular sort of tests and, and gave away her genetic information. And, and I was really a little uneasy about it because I was like, that's, that's my information too. And I've got no control over that at all. Um, which is why I argue that we should have less reliance on control because control ultimately sort of becomes unraveled at this stage, right? It's, it's our inability to control it. This is where I argue for the importance of trust. Um, this is where relationships of trust matter. Um, now, it's, there are costs to that. So if we, if we think of privacy in terms of trust, then inherently we've just made this conceptualization of privacy relational, right? So, um, so then uh, there are advantages to that in that now I can ask you if you have metadata on me, right, or if a platform has metadata on multiple people, to act in a certain way, loyal, for example, to not leverage that information against me. Um, I'm, I don't think that just because information is disclosed, your privacy is necessarily gone. I think that we disclose relationships within, uh, information within relationships of trust all the time. But what it does mean is that sometimes there are, are parties that have no relationship that have that information that can then violate uh, your privacy. So data brokers would be an obvious example where um, they don't have a direct relationship with the data subjects uh, in ways that, that platforms that collect information directly do, but, but they get information from various streams. Um, and so my general sense is that we should have a baseline set of rules that even apply to data brokers, but that a lot of our issues with respect to metadata and a lot of these sort of unraveling problems can be solved um, through thinking of privacy in terms of trust. So the, just the fact that you have it, right, or that someone else has it, um, isn't the end of the story. Rather, there are now things that you shouldn't be able to do with that information. We have a question from the Dory um, from Kane. I found that I quickly learned to click on those I'm fine with losing customers buttons because the pop-up is blocking the task I was trying to complete. What are some tips for making sure people know how to go back and change their mind when it's no longer time critical? Again, I mean, not to make everything an illustration of the limits of the control conceptualization of privacy, but um, 
often when we think of consent, consent is, is implemented in sort of binary terms, like I agree to this, and then once that is gotten, then it's sort of in perpetuity exists, and you don't have to re-ask for it again, even though people often change their minds or circumstances change. Um, this is where I do think that there is some responsibility on the part of users to take advantage of the tools that are given to them if those tools are given to them in an easy to use way. Um, I encourage everyone to at least take a, a few minutes as part of your, maybe not daily, but maybe weekly or, or monthly routine to do a little digital hygiene. Um, you know, search your own name on various search engines to see what's coming up. Um, look at the, if you have accounts um, and sometimes you have accounts even for only defensive purposes, right? So uh, sometimes people, I get resistance where they say, well, I don't want to sign up for an account for XYZ because then they'll have even more information of me, which I'm sympathetic to. But um, if it allows you to then sort of log in and regularly delete information or cleanse information, then that might be uh, positive. And then um, uh, take advantage of, of I, I think, popular add-ons. Um, I use ad blockers. Uh, which I know is controversial, but I think that's, um, that that's another possible tool. And then finally, and this is just the thing that I throw out in generally, is if two-factor authentication is ever offered anywhere, use it. Um, and and uh, use it uh, sort of early and often is, is my example. But, but I do think that, that vanity searches, you know, learning how to, to work within dashboards um, is at least a key part. It can't be everything, right? My, 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 my argument is that often users are being asked to do too much, but, but there is some sort of expectation that I think we can have of users to at least sort of try to, to exercise some, some diligence with the tools they're given. What are your thoughts on premium options? Um, so we're starting to see a lot of uh, companies moving towards that. I know we have a YouTube premium option, et cetera, um, as, a, as a method for coming back to your concept of control, right? Do you see that as valid? <sighs> I'm of two minds with the premium options. I mean, on one hand, um, I like the premium options because the business model seems a little clearer, right? So one of the things that I've always uh, been drawn to is when you can, when you, we, when everybody's incentives are sort of out in the open and we know sort of what we're dealing with, it becomes a lot easier and, and, and easier to trust. Um, I think for the premium models to work, um, there has to be not just um, some sort of soft promises, but I, but I think really robust promises. I would love the idea of, of platforms being able to opt in to sort of the gold standard of privacy, which is the, the true level of trustworthiness, where, where they, they, they say, we will be loyal, we will be discreet, we will be honest to the sort of highest standard. Um, and, then, and then that it can drive people to, to sign up for companies, right? It could be a competitive advantage. And I've, I've always longed for privacy to be a competitive advantage. Um, and I think that we're seeing a little traction on that model. But, but then the other side of me worries a little about premium models because the other thing that I worry about is that um, privacy becomes something only that people that have affordances can have. Uh, and I really worry about the sort of uh, equities where we say if you pay the if you pay the the gold standard option you get privacy for everyone that can't afford it they don't they you know they don't have that um, and so so for that for that reason I'm, I'm still actually struggling with with a lot of the way that that cashes out in in, in terms of policy um, because it I, I do worry about that and we have one more question on the dory uh, from Keith uh, what are we what are we all missing about Dragonfly? Um, and the context is a Wired story of Sundar at the Wired Summit. So Dragonfly, as I understand it, is the initiative for um, Google to be to go into to enter China's market, right? Am I understand? I mean, if I'm understanding the stories correctly, and I haven't read a lot about it, so I actually can't provide a I think a nuanced discussion. But I have thought a lot about the values that get reflected in technology. And so to that extent, I think it's worth having an explicit conversation about um, what, what the affordances of Dragonfly would be. Um, if it facilitates, because it doesn't exist in uh, a vacuum. 
This is a browser that will get deployed within a system that is actively leveraging um, things like social credit scores. Right? And the social credit score, actually, I will, I will say, scares me a lot. Um, the idea that we would be ranked based on any number of different factors and then have benefits sort of denied to us based upon those factors, that we wouldn't be able to board a plane, um, that, or that we would have sort of demerits taken away from us because we used up too many rolls of toilet paper. Um, the fact that we would be sort of datafying everything, does, does this contribute to that effort? Because that's a value that's implicated. Does it, will it help exacerbate the spread of facial recognition technology? Which is another thing that I've worried about a lot. Um, because in order to gain the benefits of facial recognition technology, of which there admittedly are many, we can find the bad guy. We can find missing children. We can um, uh, help those um, that uh, uh, don't have the ability to sense uh, in, in ways of others. And, uh, but in order to get a lot of the, the real uses of facial recognition technology, not just the sort of minor conveniences of unlocking your phone with your face rather than your fingerprint, which is fine, but I view as just a, a, a very incremental benefit. Um, but in order to get the real benefits, we will have to give up a lot, almost everything. Right? We have to have cameras everywhere. We have to have databases that are shared. Right? Facial recognition technology depends upon the existence of a name face database that's, that can recognize people. Um, and I think we have to think about that, that value as well. And will this, will this aid that in the aggregate? And is it worth then um, uh, defining the values of the company based on that? Right? Because, because your values are reflected not just in what you do, but in, but in what you build. Um, and I think that it's, it's, it merits a serious conversation about the direction of a company um, and the ethos of a company um, with, the, the, with that's creation. But, but that being said, I, I, I'd be scared to comment any more on it because I actually don't know the, the specifics of the, of the project. So. Uh, so terms and conditions seems like a necessary evil, but clearly the way that they're done today is pretty terrible because nobody reads them, and now right, people are, I guess, legally bound. I'm not even sure if they're legally binding um, because nobody understands them, nobody reads them. Is it, can you agree to something you don't read? But besides the point, and you know, there's no expectation to read them either, right. uh, which is another issue, but uh, how do you think that could be done better? Great, uh, thank you very much, I love that question. So I just wrote an essay uh, a little while back called User Agreements Are Betraying You. Uh, with the idea that, that it, it's, it's this abstraction, nuance, tension that's unre unresolvable, right? We could either have a, someone proposed at some point a 100-word user agreement, which is, that's, 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 that's not even an advertising slogan almost, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's so sort of abstracted as to not really tell you anything. Um, I think that user agreements um, could be improved upon uh, if they are uh, written in a way that uh, they are written for basically transparency purposes, because some people do read them. Actually, there's a really good article um, uh, by uh, Mike Kinsey uh, called In Defense of the Long Privacy Statement. And he says that people, some people actually do read privacy policies. Regulators do, advocates do, right? They serve an, <laughs> huh? Attorneys. attorneys, right, attorneys do. Um, uh, they serve an important hygienic function for companies, right? So they let, you, they let you know, like, internally, like, okay, here's where all our information is. We've got stock of it. Like, it's, it's an incredibly good force-functioning tool. It's just not for users, right? And so my, um, my preference would be to have a, a regulatory regime, and this is a little controversial, where there are certain things that you cannot um, trade away in a user agreement. So in other words, there's a baseline set of protections that cannot be compromised through terms and conditions. We have this in other areas of the law. Um, and then that way, users can agree to them without worrying about them, right? Because I always sort of have this, this like small sense of dread when I click, I agree. Like, I didn't read any of this, but I don't know what's in there, but I agree to it anyway. And they actually are enforceable, largely, right? So, so the, the law, uh, I teach contracts sometimes too, and the law of contracts is that if you click, I agree, then courts are going to say, you agreed. <laughs> Um, and I would like to have a, a, a talk about things that are unwaivable so that it basically didn't matter what was in the terms of agreements, right? Because they are important risk mitigation tools for companies, and they could have nice 
um, transparency and accountability aspects to them. We just have to stop pretending that they're for users. Because the things that shape users' expectations are the design, it's the website, right? It's the, it's the padlock icon, it's the button. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it, everybody. Thank you.